Ready? Uh, yeah. Perfect. The winding forest road suddenly opens up into a clearing. You've come upon a small town. The town looks rather unremarkable, save for an ominous church upon a hill near the outskirts past the village. Okay, uh, do I notice anything strange about the town? Does it seem abandoned, or are there people active there? So the town seems sparse with foot traffic, um, but there is a worker repairing a small house near the entrance to the town, and they notice you and, and beckon for you to approach. Wait, wait. Before we get near, I want to cast Detect Good and Evil. I want to know if anyone in the town has done anything evil recently. Okay. Good idea. Uh, but that's not actually how that spell works. It detects oh. beings of good and evil, not people who have done good or evil things. Oh, so you should use it to check if there are any evil people in the town then? Right. No, the spell doesn't do that either. People aren't good or evil. They have the option to choose. They have the will to choose to do good it or choose to right do evil. It says right here on my character sheet that I'm uh, lawfully good. Okay, that's that's your alignment. That's not just because you're lawful good doesn't mean you always have to do the lawfully good thing, right? It's It's really about beings who are good or evil in their essence. So a celestial, a demon, or a fiend, something like that. Wait, 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 wait. So like a celestial or something that's like an embodiment of pure good, like can only do good things? Wait, wait, like, so who even decides what's good in the first place? Right, like what if a celestial encounters the the trolley problem. Like, what if you put ten baby orcs on one track and the one human adventurer on the other track? Suddenly, like, a dragon descends oh, from no. the sky. Fantasy tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons have recently regained popularity, and are arguably more prominent in the gaming subculture today than when they first came about in the 70s, when famously a guy in his mom's basement decided to found a movement that would lead to things of great cultural import, and also ERP chat rooms. The most recent edition of Dungeons and Dragons, 5e, can be found on your nearest trans by friends dresser, and is most well known for taking what was complex in the first edition and simplifying it into a rule set that you could pick up and learn over the course of a night. While some have gone to great lengths to complain about the smaller details they didn't include, I'm more concerned by what they did choose to include. The alignment system. Alignment is somewhat unique to Dungeons and & Dragons, and has changed several times before settling into its current form of nine alignments along the axes of good and evil and law and chaos. The basic idea of alignment is interesting and useful, a label you choose for yourself that lets other people know how you see yourself and how you're likely to act in certain situations. But much like the everyday world, we run into an issue when it becomes prescriptive rather than descriptive, meaning we look at our alignment when we're deciding how to act rather than acting how we would and then choosing our alignment based on that. In the 5e Player's Handbook, the section on alignment in the multiverse has this interesting segment. Alignment is an essential part of the nature of celestials and fiends. A devil does not choose to be lawful evil, and doesn't tend toward lawful evil, but rather is lawful evil in its essence. This, as you can imagine, raises a lot of questions and has some disturbing implications. First and foremost, it seems to contradict the provided definition of moral alignment in the player's handbook. A lawful good creature is said to do what is right as expected by society, whereas a chaotic good creature will act as their conscience directs with little regard of what others expect of them. Both of these are relating the expected goodness of a good creature to either the society in which they live in or to their own personal moral sense of good and evil. This is, in essence, 
uh, undoubtedly a morally relativistic point of view. That morality is relative to the society or to the person um, in which it's coming from. But by stilling good and evil into tangible objects, qualities, and creatures, the D&D system is saying that there is an objective good and evil. Now it's completely possible to ignore this and create a universe from the supplied framework that doesn't conform to this universal theory. But for the purposes of this video, I want to focus on what is supplied and how it's most likely to be adapted. When looking at the actions and beings that comprise goodness, it's easy to see a pattern emerge. People helping others at the expense of themselves. People risking their own lives to save the life of another. People behaving altruistically. Altruism is the ethical theory that one should act in a way that benefits other people the most, regardless of your own desires. It's an example of an objective moral theory, meaning that with an altruistic lens, we can look at an action as objectively good or objectively evil, the same way that we could look at any other fact. For reference, another objective moral theory is utilitarianism, the theory that an action can be measured based on the utility of that action's outcome. As actors within an objective moral theory, actions taken by celestials, beings of good incarnate, can only be good based on the nature of who is performing that action. So celestials aren't necessarily choosing what to do, but following a predetermined order of goodness to find out what is objectively the most good action to take. So if there is a level of goodness to an action taken by a celestial, can this be applied to any action or idea? Are these ideas given worth based on their goodness in some sort of marketplace of ideas? Regardless of whoever's invisible hand guides this goodness value, it follows that these beings of good can be seen as infallible, trustworthy, and predictable in their actions. And what of evil? In Dungeons & Dragons, it's clear that evil is representative of egoism, which honestly, Fountainhead makes a lot more sense when you realize it was literally written by Glazia, Princess of the Nine Hells, and Lord Warden of Malbog, the home of the feared Spinagons. On a completely 100% unrelated note, there are also these aforementioned beings who are evil in their essence. Just as we can expect Celestials to do the right thing every time, we can expect these fiends to do the most self-serving thing possible every time. So it makes sense that we see these beings as duplicitous, untrustworthy, uncaring, evil, but most importantly, they're also predictable in their actions. This sets up a predictable conflict, a dualism between good and evil with unchanging representatives in the Celestials and Fiends, a defined and rigid in-group with values you agree with, and an irreconcilable outgroup, an us with a shared innate quality, and a them with an equally innate opposing quality. And that might be the most real thing in Dungeons and Dragons, which if your game doesn't pose lawful evil societies in a fascist light, consider how easily it fits. However, when you take into account the overt religious illusions, you start to see why these themes are instantly recognizable. They draw upon a culturally ingrained expectation in history. When you look at these beings, you see angels, devils, and other things that could have been lifted straight from Christian Renaissance era artworks. And that makes sense because the ideas behind these beings are also suitably Christian. Many of us are familiar with these images and the ideas that surround them, but are wholly unaware of their origin and history. Specifically, it's important to look at the popularity and history of a dualistic God and the agents of good versus the devil and the agents of evil mentality. 
For many reasons, the Renaissance precipitated and indicated an era of great change and unrest in Europe. The Catholic Church began to face greater threats from within and without. Previously, they had used their small inquisitorial office to handle heretical beliefs. Heresy being any Christian teaching that contradicts the established and firm beliefs of the Catholic Church. Prior to this, the Catholic Church mostly dealt with other religions, but with a greater ability to disseminate knowledge and the translation of the Bible into a language understood by the local populace, more and more people began to reject the authority of the Catholic Church. A large variety of these heretical beliefs began to spread and started what is now called the Protestant Reformation. Protestant because they were in protest to the Catholic Church. As you can imagine, the Catholic Church was displeased with people challenging their monopoly on the Word of God and massively ramped up their inquisitorial work during this time, torturing and often killing suspected heretics to stop the spread of heretical beliefs. What does this have to do with the dualism that we were talking about earlier? Well, one belief that was once discouraged, but now started to see itself spread more widely, was that Satan, in all of his trickery, was leading good Catholics astray into heretical beliefs that the devil himself was at work in the world around us. While the Catholic Church did not directly endorse this idea, it quickly spread among all sorts of Christians and became the foundation for the witch trials that would come later. A very popular book during this time, Malaeus Maleficarum, written by Catholic clergyman Heinrich Kramer, outlines the disturbing origin of our conception of demons and devils when he writes, Satan caused a certain heretical perversity to grow up in the land of the Lord, a heresy, I say, of sorceresses, since it is to be designated by the particular gender of which he is known to have power. Yikes. Well, Kramer is specifically using this theory to peddle his misogynist BS. You can see how this theory was used as a vehicle to discriminate against marginalized and minority groups. This is where our conception of this dualism of good versus evil, angels versus devils, and celestials versus fiends comes from. Historically, this dualism was used to justify the systematic killing and torture of people who were deemed a threat to the power and authority of people higher on the social order. And if that's not enough to make you rethink our use of these Christian images, then consider the commonality of women as evil creatures. Consider the pointedly gendered creatures of the night hag and the succubus and consider what message these creatures might send to the people who see them. I'm not here to take away your succubus waifu, though. I think other people are much better suited to deconstruct the messaging and cultural appropriation of the monster designs. Instead, I want to take a look at other examples of this dualism in fantasy games so that I can describe how it's affected me personally in my life and in my worldview. And yes, before you go down and type up your comment about how sad I must be that my life was directly affected by video games, consider how incredibly the way that we view things and the values we hold has been affected by colonization. This dualism isn't the only way that gaming has been affected by colonization, and it's not even the only thing in Dungeons and Dragons that has been affected by colonization. I'm going to be focusing on this dualism though, so for other examples, please do check out Conquest of Dread's Decolonizing Games video. It's no surprise that games inspired by Dungeons and Dragons sometimes echo this idea of a dualistic and objective good and evil. World of Warcraft seems to be one of these games, and has a really interesting take on the concept that provided me a really meaningful and personal opportunity to tackle some of the issues that it poses. When I got back into WoW several years ago, I made it to max level on my first character. 
a Blood Elf, Death Knight, and Warlords of Draenor. When Legion came out, I wanted to play Alliance with a few different friends, and I really enjoyed the faster pace of the Demon Hunter, so that became my main character. It was fun, mindless action, something I could do while watching Netflix with my brain half turned off. At least, that was until I saw this cinematic. We are blessed to be in your presence once more, Zira. Turalyon, you have found the Chosen One. Illidan, from birth, the light in your eyes held such promise for the future. Sacrificed that birthright long ago. Do you not wish to reclaim what was lost? To be whole again? The Legion's end is all I seek. My child, you've given so much for so little. Your true potential. Your redemption lies before you. Let go of your shattered form and embrace the light's power. I've traded my freedom for power before. The prophecy must be fulfilled. When I first saw this cinematic, I really didn't know what to make of it. Instinctively, I sided with Zira, the narrow killed by Illidan. I thought it was reckless of Illidan to kill such a powerful being of light when they were just trying to do the right thing. Even though I sided with Zira, I never felt right about it. I was feeling the cognitive dissonance at play between what I witnessed and what I believed to be true. Oblivious as I was though, I contended to forget about it, move on to the next quest. Now that I've grown in so many ways, I'd like to go back to this scene to figure out why I had such a hard time with it. So let's break it down. In the World of Warcraft Mythos, the universe is composed of two forces, the Light and the Void. The Chronicles lore book puts it like this. Before life began, before even the cosmos took shape, there was Light and there was Void. The book then goes on to describe the material world being formed at the point where the light and void collided, with beings of both manifesting from the essence. This is textbook religious good versus evil dualism, right? The light is a stand-in for the force of good and the void of evil. We've seen this before. But actually, WoW goes to an incredibly interesting place with its dualism. See, the beings formed from light are called the Naru, and Zero was the prime Naru at the time of their death, which means that Illidan killed a being of good, a being who could only do good, a being I'd been trained to align myself with. Looking back, it's clear to me why I instinctively sided with Zero. I'd seen this before. The angelic beings are good throughout all the media I've seen, with one notable exception. Path clear, all systems green. Evangelion! Ready for launch. Understood. Can we really do this? Of course. Unless we defeat the angels, we have no future. Unfortunately, I hadn't seen Ava yet, but in everything I had seen, the story was always the same. 
the angels are good. Even saying now it sounds silly. Of course the angelic beings are good. They're angelic. I had been taught through culture and media that certain people were above reproach. But in that video, what was actually happening? Was it really a video showing Illidan rejecting a gift and killing an innocent being of light? When I see it now, I see it for what it really is. An authority figure, a representative of justice, violating the bodily autonomy and consent of another person. I'm frankly disgusted that I originally came away from that video on the side of that authority figure. I'd been thoroughly influenced by a culture that depicted beings of light, of goodness, of healing as infallible, good in their very essence. And because of that, I was unable to see a direct violation of someone else's body right in front of me. Thankfully, this happened in a video game, not real life, but the implications are startling. As humans, we like to simplify things. It's almost certainly why we see so many constructed binaries. We like to think in black and white. And I think it's also why we like role-playing games with these systems in them. It allows us to live in an idealized world where some people are good and some people are bad, just by nature. In the US and many other countries, we are culturally exposed to the same kind of good versus evil dualism present in Dungeons and Dragons. We are drawn to construct the same kind of dualistic groups in our head. The good police versus the evil criminals. The good Democrats versus the evil Republicans. The groups are often malleable and different people will divide the groups differently. What's important are the same assumptions made above apply. The end group, infallible, trustworthy, predictably good in their actions. The outgroup? Duplicitous, untrustworthy, uncaring, evil, predictably bad in their actions. I'm not saying that certain groups aren't all of those things. It's not wrong to create these groups so long as they aren't determined by innate qualities not chosen by the individual. This is the biggest problem with the system in Dungeons and Dragons. It makes what should be a choice into an innate quality. That's biological essentialism, Wizards of the Coast. Congratulations, you've done a biological essentialism. I hope you're happy with yourself, Mr. Wizard. It's vitally important if we are going to turn everything into a team sport to ensure we are not disregarding evidence and reason based solely on the team. If you encounter an individual who is a member of the outgroup, writing them off without provocation dehumanizes the person and communicates an inability to assimilate that person. Similarly, if you see someone in your in-group who's been accused of doing something terrible, disregarding it without any thought is dangerous. Team X would never do evil thing Y applies the action to the team, not the team member. Personally, I try to avoid and recognize any assumptions I make about a person before I know them. More often than not, my assumptions have been more harmful than helpful. Hopefully the next time an authority figure and representative of justice, someone who's supposed to be on our team, violates someone's bodily autonomy, will understand why people feel the need to defend them. I don't think it's necessary or even beneficial to eliminate these groups. After all, identity is a powerful and important tool. All we can hope to do is recognize how they influence us, which groups are helpful, and which should remain fantasy. Thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. I've been working on this one for a while now, and I'm happy with how it turned out. Coincidentally, Wizards of the Coast announced that they were removing the concept of evil races as I was editing this video. I'm not sure how extensive it will be, but it seems like it will only be targeting playable races and other creatures that fall into the relativistic side rather than the objective side. This is a good first step, and I'm glad they've committed to making this change. I also want to take this time to thank the wonderful people who contributed to this video. Curio, Conquest of Dread, and Transparency. Thank you very much. Links to their channels are in the description, and I highly recommend you check them out. I'm planning on posting a video soon with my plans for the future, what I've been working on, and what you can expect coming up on my channel. If you haven't yet, please follow me on Twitter, at ThatJessicaG, for all kinds of updates and sneak peeks. Thanks again for watching.